We're going to 1 Timothy chapter 5 in your Bibles. 1 Timothy chapter 5. As we noted when we started our study, and then we've covered it again in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy, verse 15, Paul refers to the church as the family of God, his household, and that he is writing so that we'll know how to conduct ourselves in God's household, how his family ought to behave. So it's natural when we come over to chapter 5, after addressing Timothy about some of his own personal life issues, how he could conduct, should conduct himself, uh, verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but you would be an example of the believer and a pattern that they can follow. Don't neglect your spiritual gift. Pay attention to yourself and to your teaching, and that will ensure salvation for yourself and for those who hear you. That leads us into chapter 5 about the relationships that Timothy will have with different groups within the church. Church is comprised of older people, younger people, married people, single people. Uh, he'll deal particularly with widows. In biblical times, there were slaves and masters. When we get down into chapter 6, he'll deal with those. So you have basically through chapter 5 and the first part of chapter 6 talking about the relationship, young and old, widows, older, older people, slaves, masters, how the family is relate together, to relate together. It is taken for granted that God's family will be composed of diversity. Uh, not just a church for young people. Not just a church for older people. Or other kinds of division. And so we are to learn to function together in a godly way. That's part of God's plan. You're going to have the same kind of instruction when you get to more personal issues as you had with other issues as well. A lot to take note of that. In verse 11, he says, prescribe and teach these things. Then down in chapter 5, verse 7, prescribe these things as well. Then we would get down into chapter 6, verse 2. Teach and preach these things. So, pervades. These are things that are constantly to be brought before the people. Uh, they are to be taught. They are to be remembered. Uh, they are to be put into practice. He starts out with treatment of the old and the young. Um, these are things essential for godliness. Do not rebuke an older man but rather appeal to him as a father and to the younger men as brothers, the older women as mothers, the younger women as sisters in all purity. Uh, so we're the household of God. There's going to be senior citizens. There's going to be younger people, uh, young adults. Um, you have to function properly together with these people, Timothy. Um, it starts out with a rather unusual word. It's only going to be used one other time in the New Testament. Uh, talks about a really sharp, stern, harsh rebuke. Do not sharply rebuke an older man. That so uh, notes a severe uh, reprimand or censure. Originally, the word meant to hit somebody with your fists. And then it came to be used as a metaphor for, in effect, beating on someone with your words. Being harsh with them, unkind. So, Timothy, as one who would be identified with the younger people, we noted perhaps under uh, 40 or under, uh, he was told in chapter 4, verse 12, don't let anyone look down on your youthfulness. 
But you also have to deal with respect for those who are older. Do not sharply rebuke an older man. Uh, Rather, encourage him. That word, appeal. Appeal to him. Encourage him. As a father. Uh, Older people need to be corrected at times. We don't know everything until we're 70 or older. Um, And at times, younger people in the position God's given them, like Timothy, are in a position to have to bring correction to older people. But they need to do it with respect and understanding. So they appeal to them. They encourage them. Uh, There is the way you would deal with your father. Uh, You appeal to him, encourage him. Uh, So you see the family picture here. Um, They may not be your physical parent, your physical father. But you have a sense of how you should deal with them in God's family. The same way you would deal with your father. Uh, It would be improper for the young person to rebuke in a harsh way their father. So it is improper within God's family as well. There is to be a respect, a consideration, but the correction does need to be done. It's just to be done with the proper attitude and uh, with the proper uh, respect to the older man. You treat the younger men as brothers, and Timothy would be one in that group. He treats them as a family member as well. They're brothers. They're talking here about the men. He'll come to the women in a, mo- in a moment. So again, the dealing with them is uh, with proper respect and love and consideration. Uh, for pride and arrogance. Now, when we're dealing with false teaching, there will be a a certain firmness, even a certain harshness, if the false teaching is not stopped. It doesn't mean we go soft and allow for everything in the name of love. But here, in the general flow of our functioning as a family, there is respect, there is consideration. And as we minister to one another, and part of that ministry will be correcting error or faults. Timothy will have that responsibility. He does, uh, deals with the younger men as brothers. Um, Now we can put these things in the context if we come over to Timothy. Paul wrote another letter to another a uh, young man who worked with him, who was representing him um, in another area, uh, but acting as Paul's representative. And in chapter 2 of the letter to Titus, did I say Titus? Titus 2, if I didn't give you the right book. <laughs> he addresses older men and says, Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Then he'll down in verse 6 address the younger men. They are to be sensible, showing themselves an example of good deeds, purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So there is to be the proper conduct among the older men and the younger men, and when there is something that needs to be corrected, those correcting, for example, Timothy here, but it would continue down for us, is to be done with the right attitude, um, the respect for one another. Now, where improper conduct uh, persists, then we have to deal with it in a more severe way. We saw that in chapter 1, where certain men have to be commanded not to teach other doctrines. And Paul has turned some men over to Satan for their refusal to stop teaching error but in our general flow we are a family and being a mixture of older and younger is good for us 
because we learn to relate to one another. We learn to deal with one another properly. And the younger learn to be patient with the older. The older learn to be patient with the younger. Even when it comes to music, right? All right. Uh, Verse 2, back in 1 Timothy 5, we just pick up with the older women, and I mean the uh, older women and then the younger women. The older women, you appeal to them as you would your mother. Um, Again, you want to encourage them uh, where there needs to be instruction or correction. It has to be done with understanding, the way you would talk to your mother, with respect, with honor, not harsh, not talking down to them, um, not rebuking them in a uh, disrespectful way. At your age, you ought to know better uh, kind of attitude. but want to bring them along by the same token. Uh, So Timothy is to be dealing with these people here, uh, and whether it's the older men or the older women, they have to come along. We all have to grow. None of us are done growing. And that means we who are older have to be open to the ministry of the younger. Um, Timothy's instructed here, but that's why we went to Titus, we are also reminded as the older people of our conduct and what it ought to be, and so are the younger. So, yes, this is our conduct, and when it's not what it ought to be, then there will be ministry to us. But we do it as family members, uh, bringing members of the family along. So you deal with the older women as you would deal with your mother, and the younger women as a sister. And there is a caution here in all purity. Um, Up in verse 12 of chapter 4, Timothy was reminded of this. And the younger, uh, it becomes more of a danger. So in chapter 4, verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, purity. Show yourself an example. Now down here, When a younger man like Timothy is dealing with the younger women, he has to treat them as sisters. And he has to be careful that purity is maintained when uh, that kind of conduct and that kind of ministry is going on. Uh, In Titus chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and uh, this is a pattern that we need to be sure we maintain. He talks about the older woman's responsibility in verse 3 to be reverent, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. What they're teaching is encouraging the young women to love their husbands, love their children, be sensible, pure, workers at home, subject to their own husbands, so the word of God will not be dishonored. This ministry of developing and encouraging the younger women takes place with the older women. And that will help in uh, the maintaining of purity and uh, the protection of all concern. The younger women are to be treated as sisters in all purity. Back in 1 Timothy chapter 5, he moves to a special uh, group now. Widows, and that's going to be um, the subject all the way down through verse 16. So he speaks in a um, concise, general way uh, about ministry to, you know, just groups. The elderly men, the elderly women, the younger men, the younger women. But now he's going to break out a special group that needs special attention. And it's quite an extensive section when you consider from verse 3 down through verse 16, he's talking about widows and the responsibility of the church in its ministry to widows. Uh, He starts out in verse 3, honor widows 
who are widows indeed. Uh, and when he says widows indeed, he's indicating here not just widows, but widows who have no family who could help take care of them. And uh, this would continue. We have today certain uh, maybe safety nets that help with this. But the responsibility is still here for us in God's family. And we have a responsibility to those who are widows indeed. We are to honor them, show them respect. You know, no one is dealt with here in this section as a burden, as a problem that is sort of draining us or weighing us down. And the widows are not viewed that way either. They are those worthy of our honor, worthy of our respect. Um, and this honor will show, uh, demonstrate itself in being sure that their material needs are met. Uh, not excuses. Well, maybe their husband should have made better preparation or um, kids who may have uh, pre-deceased uh, them kind of thing. No, you are going to honor widows indeed. Then the qualification. This, this problem, maybe we ought to go back to Acts 6 before we move on. This came up early in the church. Acts chapter 6 starts out, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebrews. So they're both Jews, the Hellenistic Jews, Jews primarily that uh, had uh, perhaps been raised outside Palestine and uh, had a Greek influence uh, versus the what we call native Jews native to uh, Israel, the land. Uh, so there's a disagreement between these two groups because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So the church had taken responsibility here for the widows. But there was hard feelings. Uh, these Hellenistic Jews thought that the native Hebrew Jewish Christians were overlooking their widows. And so a dispute arises. And the 12 disciples who are the head of the church, which is the church of Jerusalem at this point, um, that's the church as it exists, uh, said we can't take time for the ministry of the word to be responsible for this. So they appoint men to and they have to be godly men, verse 3, seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit of wisdom, who can be put in charge of this task. They chose Stephen, verse 5, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and on the list. Interestingly, these are uh, men with names uh, of Greek background, which would seem to indicate part of the way we're going to deal this, and so nobody has any question. If the Greek widows are being, the Jewish Greek widows are being overlooked, we'll put godly Jewish Greek men over the distribution of these things. But you see, early on, the church sensed its responsibility, and it's serious enough, it needs godly men. Uh, sometimes Acts 6, as we noted uh, earlier in our study of 1 Timothy, is taken as the origin of deacons, but regardless, we got... Uh, the picture of what's happening. Come back to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now, we honor widows who are widows indeed. But not every widow is a widow indeed because some widows would have family members. And so those family members should assume the responsibility. But if any widow has children or grandchildren. They must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family. 
and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Uh, King James said if they have children or nephews, uh, the old word uh, nephews as it was used back uh, in the 17th century referred to grandchildren. But it's uh, here talking about children or grandchildren. In other words, in the family. They have physical family. Either their children or their grandchildren. This responsibility is passed on. Sometimes the parents outlive their own children. That could happen here uh, with uh, a mother whose husband died and perhaps her children died. Um, then the grandchildren have the responsibility. So they must first learn to practice piety, uh, godliness at home. This becomes part of godly character. Uh, now, it could be you would have a believing widow and maybe her family would not be believers and would refuse the responsibility, particularly if you have here a Jewish mother who's converted to Christ and the family will not have anything to do, then naturally the church would pick that, uh, be willing to pick it up. But in the general pattern, and uh, this was true in Israel, and so... Uh, it would be a special case where these Jews wouldn't have done it, but it could happen, you know. Some families will have nothing to do with a believer. But here, at least the general pattern. If there's children, they ought to learn to practice godliness. This is a constant emphasis. Important to see this is one of the practical areas of godliness. It's not just reading my Bible and praying. It is living life as God intends. Uh, this word uh, translated piety, godliness. Um, come back to chapter 2. It's used eight times in Timothy, 1 Timothy here. In chapter 2, verse 2, we are praying for kings and all in authority so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness. Down in chapter 3, verse 16, by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And here you have the summary of uh, the ministry of Christ as we have seen. In chapter 4, verse 7, the end of the verse, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That means you have nothing to do with false teaching and false doctrine. Um, verse 8, Godliness is profitable for all things. Still in chapter 4, verse 8. You see that complete emphasis on godliness, godliness and the importance of godliness. Jump over to chapter 6, verse 3. If anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the teaching conforming to godliness. You know, often this word used in the context of being faithful to the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's word. But godliness also involves fulfilling my responsibility in my family, like taking care of a widowed mother or grandmother. Uh, it's all part of godliness. It permeates my entire life. Um, in verse 5, we'll finish this up of chapter 6. Uh, talks about constant friction between men of depraved mind, deprived of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. Verse 11. Flee from these things, you man of God. Pursue righteousness, godliness, and so on. So we're talking about godliness. Uh, when we're studying 1 Timothy, we're talking about how God's people, his family, should conduct themselves. Well, we are the family of God. We ought to be characterized by godliness. Uh, lives that are pleasing to him, honoring to him, 
So back in chapter 5, verse 4. If any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice godliness, piety, in regard to their own family, and make some return to their parents. And others recognize the benefits I've received from my parents, their care for me, uh, in raising me to be an adult, and so on. I honor them as my parents. I have an appreciation that I show to them. Uh, You know, that's to be expected and required. It was true under the Old Testament law. Honor your father and your mother. One of the Ten Commandments, the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Back up to the letter to the Ephesians. You get the idea this may have been an issue in the church at Ephesus because Timothy is at Ephesus when Paul writes to him. Then he writes the letter to the church at Ephesus, the letter to the Ephesians, and in Ephesians chapter 6, he says in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. And then for children, honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth, then instruction to fathers in how they deal with their children. But it was God's instruction to his people in the Old Testament. You honor your father and your mother. In fact, in the Old Testament, the law provided if you had a child who showed disrespect to his parents and wouldn't obey, you could bring him to the elders and they would stone him to death. Um, rather severe. Um, So back in chapter 5, we have to first learn to practice godliness in your own family. Easy to pervade godliness, you know, in the church. But if we're neglecting our family, if I'm not fulfilling my responsibility there, I'm not a godly person. So first learn to practice godliness at home. Remember, uh, Jesus had to rebuke the Jewish leaders of his day. They, you've found a way to get around this. You claim that you, what you have, you've devoted to the Lord, so you can't use it for supporting your parents. And you try to cancel out what God has said by coming up with a tradition that may make you look in the eyes of men as spiritual But God is not fooled. You are canceling the word of God. So they make a return to their parents. Why would you do this? The end of verse 4. For this is acceptable. It's pleasing in the sight of God. It's what pleases God. Isn't that what godliness is? Isn't this what we are to do as the family of God? Do what is pleasing to him. Uh, So, starts at home. That's where I begin. I can't say, well, I give my money to the church and I I just don't have anything left over to take care of my poor mother or my poor grandmother. Um, I'd love to, but, you know, I have to give to the Lord and I couldn't take what I'm going to give to the Lord No, no, you start with godliness at home uh, and fulfill the responsibility there. And it's not to be viewed as a burden. I mean, is pleasing God a burden? Um, I mean, it doesn't mean that that there aren't responsibilities that weigh on us in a sense, but it's not a burden in the sense, I wish I didn't have to do it. I wish I didn't have to please God. If this is what is pleasing in the sight of God, if I'm complaining about having to take care of my widowed mother or grandmother, what am I complaining about? I don't like having to please God. You know, I pray, I want to please God. Well, do what he says. You want to read here? Take care of your widowed mother or grandmother. Uh, Okay, verse 5. I'm going to elaborate on this. Uh, now, he, she who is a widow indeed, 
and who has been left alone. This is, has no family. I mean, the church is the only family she has. Uh, no details here. Um, whether, you know, she didn't have children, her husband died, or uh, her children have died. That would seem to be what you get the idea in the kind. But whatever, there are no children or grandchildren. Uh, she's a widow indeed, has been left alone. Uh, she has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. Um, what can she do? This is an older woman. We're going to see. We won't get there. But uh, down in verse 9, she has to be at least 60 years old. What are you going to do? Things haven't changed. They're not, you know, she's going to go out and get a job. She's an older woman. Um, you know, uh, how much older? One of those doesn't matter. It'll be 60 and above in the context as we move along through this section. Uh, who can she do? There's no family. I can't ask my children for help or my grandchildren. There is no one. All she can do is cast herself on the mercy of God. She's fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers day and night. Her life is characterized by trusting God, asking him to provide for her. Uh, she's demonstrating true godly character. This is preparing for those widows that the church will be responsible for. Uh, godly widows. That doesn't mean that if I have a mother who's not saved, I'm not responsible for her. That's part of my physical family responsibility. As he said, that's just paying back what is owed, so to speak. But he's leading into what the church's responsibility is here. Uh, that's a little different issue in the widows that the church will take care of. So here's a godly widow. She's looking to God to surprise her need, supply her need. In contrast, a woman who lives a life, uh, who is a widow who gives herself to a light of life of pleasure has nothing. Uh, she's dead while she lives. And the word uh, we have translated wanton pleasure is a strong word. It's a miserable word. It's only used one other time in the New Testament. Uh, in uh, James chapter 5, verse 5, just selfish, self-indulgent kind of living. This widow is dead while she lives. Um, excluded from the life of God. Uh, the church at Sardis had a name that it was alive, but it's dead. Uh, this widow would have physical life. So the contrast here. So the church sees, we're talking about a godly widow. Uh, there'll be further uh, guidelines given. In the next section for our next study about a widow who gets to be enrolled in the church but he makes clear here he's talking about godly widows who have the potential to be supported by the church uh, not just any widow a widow living a life of godless pleasure and selfishness uh, is not one in view uh, what is he to do Prescribe these things as well, so they may be above reproach. Now, we've seen this word prescribe, prescribe, prescribe. Uh, we saw it in verse 11 of chapter 4, remember these uh, three times. Prescribe and teach these things. Verse 7 of chapter 5, prescribe these things. And then down in chapter 6, the end of the verse, uh, the end of verse 2, teach and preach these, and I don't know why they put the word principles there in italics, it's the same thing, Greek word talta, things. Um, so it's there. You could have put these things and it's the same thing, expression is used in the other two. The word translated prescribe is the word for giving a command, giving a charge. Uh, 
Um, you command. We've dealt with this back in uh, chapter 1 of Timothy, verse 3. I urge you upon my departure from Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct. We know to the word instruct, there's the word command. It's translated command down in chapter 1, verse 18. This command I entrust to you. Various forms of the same word, command. So when he says prescribe these things, command them, charge them. Not command in the uh, harsh, unkind way, but these are things required. They must be required, they must be taught, they must know that this is a necessity. Um, so here, in this context of talking about proper family relationships, this is just not something in passing, not uh, maybe as relevant as some other things we would think as the sound doctrine. No, Timothy, you must be commanding these things. These are required for God's family and how it is the function, that they may be above reproach. Uh, nothing can be brought against them. Um, it becomes a serious thing if you don't take care of your own family, and that's what verse 8 goes on to say. Uh, if anyone does not provide for his family. This is uh, the negative of what he instructed positively in verse 4. Taking care of your family. And particularly the widows. The children and the grandchildren are responsible. The negative, verse 8, what if they don't? If anyone does not provide for his own. And especially for those of his own household. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Worse than an unbeliever, why? Because even unbelievers take care of their parents. I mean, in the Roman and Greek world, uh, there were clear guidelines set down, expectations. You lose respect in the community if you weren't showing proper respect to your parents and seeing they were cared for. That's what the unbelieving world was doing. I mean, for a person to profess to be a believer and not fulfill this responsibility, they've denied the faith. I mean, that's strong language. I mean, no matter what you claim as far as your relationship with Christ, your life denies it. I mean, you don't want to be pleasing to God. You don't want to do what pleases Him. You don't even carry out the responsibility that the unbeliever recognizes. You're worse than an unbeliever. Uh, it raises the question of the genuineness of their salvation. This idea that we have to accept it just because someone says they are is not true. Look over in Titus chapter 1. Verse 16. If I get to Titus, I'm in the wrong book. Titus 1, 16. They profess to know God. But they, by their deeds they deny him, being detestable and disobedient, worthless for any good deed. Sounds similar to what he's saying uh, to Timothy. What? They're, they're disobedient. Uh, worthless for any good deed. I mean, they're worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. They've denied the faith. They profess to know God, but their practice doesn't bear it out. You say, well, they come to church. Now, they do this or that, but they're not taking care of their family. It's the context back in 1 Timothy chapter 5. They're not fulfilling that basic foundational 
practice of godliness up in verse 4. They first learned to practice godliness in regard to their own family. You can't bypass that. I'm going on to the advanced level. I'm skipping the foundation. No. You learn to practice this. This is foundational. Uh, If you're not doing this, you're denying the faith. You're worse than an unbeliever. Well, how are you going to have someone, you know, we dealing with a true believer or not? Well, you know, pretty strong language. I mean, someone who denies the faith and is worse than an unbeliever, are they going to be a member in good standing in God's family? Pretty hard to see that. Um, so it's put positively and negatively. Uh, God cares for his people. He cares for his family. Uh, Now, he's going to go on where we're going with this, and we're not going to go further, so we'll be done a little early. Uh, He's going to go on for instructions on how the church can keep track of the widows who are widows indeed. And this becomes a monetary responsibility of the church. Um, Now, part of that would be discerning who are the widows indeed. Um, You know, we have widows who have family. Um, In our church, part of that may have to be sorted out because uh, sometimes our families are in different churches because we have a variety of churches in the same community. And so some parents are attending a different church than their children. They may all be believers. So even though might be a widow in this church, or you may have a widowed mother in another church, doesn't change the responsibility. Um, So the church would look into that, but he'll give instructions on uh, how these Elderly widows are to be cared for. And it is a responsibility we are to fulfill. Now, not every widow who's a widow indeed would be in need. I mean, it's not a matter we just support any widow who has no family. Maybe uh, her deceased husband left her ample means to be cared for. Um, then, of course, the church doesn't have to do that. But we want to be careful that we don't look for excuses not to do it. Well, you know, it should have been something they took care of. Well, what we have to deal with is the situation as it is. If it's a widow indeed, and she has no means to meet her basic needs, then it will be a responsibility of the church. Basic fact of godliness. And the instruction for how the church to arrange this. And the distinction between widows over 60 and under 60 will be the subject of the next section. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, your provision for us as your family in this place. In even the most basic of areas. And Lord, it is a privilege to have lives pleasing to you. And we thank you, Lord, for godly homes. Thank you for families that are caring for one another. Uh, Widows who are being provided for by their family members, their children or grandchildren. And Lord, for us as a church, it is a privilege to step in and be involved in situations where there may be special needs and there may be widows indeed. Lord, we are encouraged as we contemplate how practical our lives are as your children. Uh, In every area, we are to manifest godly character, to live lives that are pleasing to you, And that's our goal, individually and then as a church family. Lord, may we never forget that we are a family. Um, Senior citizens, 
young adults, all ages. We minister to one another. We want to minister to one another with a proper attitude in love, care, and concern. And we want to take care of one another. May we be a testimony that is pleasing to you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.